Hello, everybody, and, uh, and welcome to this International Dialogue Initiative panel on the Good Friday Agreement a generation later. I'm Jerry Frum. I'm the president of the IDI, and we're delighted that all of you have joined us, and we look forward to hearing from you later on in the conversation. The International Dialogue Initiative, very briefly, is a small group of professionals from different countries and different disciplines who come together to study the psychological aspects of societal conflict. Among other things, we conduct training workshops, and we've just come out with a book called We Don't Speak of Fear, Large Group Identity, Societal Conflict, and Collective Trauma, published last month by Phoenix. Here it is, and uh, we, we thank uh, Opus for the book launch they gave us just a few weeks ago. Um, in that book, I write about a tattoo on the shoulder of a young woman whose father was shot during the sectarian violence in Northern Ireland. The tattoo read, bullets don't just travel through skin and bone, they travel through time. Well, so do agreements. For the Good Friday Agreement, which effectively ended the sectarian violence between Protestant Unionists and Catholic Republicans, there is the very long time leading up to the signing about which George Mitchell, the US interlocutor said something like, we failed and failed and failed until one day we didn't. And then there are the 25 years since the signing. The silver anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement last month is cause for great celebration and many world leaders have recognized that. After all, how many agreements between warring parties have held for so long? But like all human agreements and all human relationships, human agreements need tending to as times change, contexts change, and people along with their leaders change as well. So today we have the opportunity to explore the Good Friday Agreement as a living document, how it emerged, how it has played out over time, and the challenges and perhaps the opportunities it faces today. To do this, we are very fortunate to have three people with us who have years of experience in Northern Ireland. Uh, our lead panelist will be Lord John Alderdice. John is a member of the Upper House of the British Parliament and former president of Liberal International, the World Federation of Liberal Political Parties. As leader of the Alliance Party, he was one of the negotiators of the Good Friday Agreement, and then elected to be first speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly, a role in which he served for six years. After that, he was one of the four international commissioners overseeing security normalization. John is a psychoanalytic, psychotherapist, and psychiatrist, who has many interests and conducts many projects all around the world, and is currently a senior research fellow at Harris Manchester College, Oxford University, and executive chairman of the Changing Character of War Center at Pembroke College, Oxford. John is also a vice president and a co-founder of the International Dialogue Initiative. Now, I think I'll also introduce our two other panelists, Eva Grossman, uh, Eva is a co-founder and CEO of the Center for Democracy and Peacebuilding in Belfast. She also curates TEDx Stormont and is an advisor to Rising Global Peace Forum in Coventry. And she's the director for public affairs at the Center for the Resolution of Intractable Conflict, Harris Manchester College in Oxford. And Peter McBride is a post-conflict mental health specialist and consultant who has worked internationally to develop a deeper understanding of the lasting impact of violence on vulnerable communities. He has worked in bereavement, mental health, learning disability and addiction services, including as the group chief executive of Inspire Wellbeing, one of Ireland's foremost mental health and learning disability organizations. Uh, I've had the pleasure and privilege of working with all three of these dear colleagues 
and I'm very grateful to each of you for joining us today. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation about the Good Friday Agreement a generation later. Now, just by way of format, I'll invite John to lead off with his remarks, and then we'll have uh, responses and new thoughts from Eva and Peter. Then I'm going to invite the three of you to have a conversation for a short time. And then I will invite our audience to raise questions and make comments. How does that sound? OK. Then, John, why don't you start us off? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jerry. And thanks to IDI colleagues for setting this up. And it's a delight to join you and, of course, to work as I do on a pretty continuing basis with Eva and Peter. When I got involved with political life in Northern Ireland, I did so really because I felt a, a moral compunction to address the fact that people were being killed, injured, and having their lives destroyed over many years in a way that seemed quite intractable. There had been lots of other efforts to try to resolve the problems, thoughtful, energetic. People often stuck with it for a long time, but the killing continued. And so I decided I would try to get involved and see what I could do. I wasn't at all convinced by the political science arguments at the time that this was all a matter of post-colonial poverty and, and so on. It didn't seem to me that that really addressed the issues on the ground or gave us a way to resolve them. And so I decided to get involved in psychiatry and in psychoanalysis so that if I could understand why individual people did harmful things to themselves, maybe I could understand why a whole community of people did. And then, uh, having done my training and having been enriched by conversations with a number of colleagues, not least with Vamek Vulcan, who was working at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville at that time, I took the ideas into politics and became involved with one of the political parties, the Alliance Party. In fact, I wrote to all the parties that were not directly involved in violence uh, and invited them to send me their information. Broadly speaking, there were some parties on the Protestant Unionist side who wanted to be part of the United Kingdom, some parties on the Catholic Nationalist side who wanted to be part of the United Ireland. But there was one party in the centre called the Alliance Party which had people from both Protestant and Catholic backgrounds, which basically wanted to see an outcome to which all the people could give their consent and where there would be the possibility of changing the future in a positive way, generation by generation. It was basically, in British terms, a liberal political party, concerned to be tolerant and open to those who were different and to try to create a, a pluralist and tolerant society. I got involved with the party. After some years, I became the leader of the party. And that gave me the opportunity to meet with prime ministers like Margaret Thatcher, Charles Hockey, and their successors, and also to meet with the other political leaders that were not involved directly in violence. I say that because that meant I could meet with John Hume, the great nationalist leader, uh, with Jim Molyneux, who was the leader of the largest unionist party at that time, Ian Paisley, whose party was not so big then, came bigger later. But I did not meet with Jerry Adams and his colleagues because of their intimate involvement with the violence of the IRA at that time. Meeting with them came much later. The general perspective of the time, which I have to say I shared, was that it was not really possible to engage in negotiations with those who are actively involved in terrorism. Uh, but if it was possible to bring together the broad mass of people, Protestant, Catholic, Unionist, Nationalist, who wanted a better life for themselves and their children, then we could reach an agreement uh, and marginalize those on the extremes. Well, it seemed a perfectly reasonable thing to try to do. There was only one problem with it. It didn't work. Every time we brought people together, something could be done that would literally blow it apart. Bombs planted, people assassinated, shot, uh, injured, uh, and, and the whole thing would go to pieces. Each side would blame the other side and the possibility of an agreement vanished into the future again. And I very well remember a day when I was sitting with the three other main leaders involved in the party talks at that time, John Hume, Ian Paisley, and Jim Molyneux. And John said, you know, folks, we're really not getting very far. 
And I don't think we're going to be able to resolve this without me engaging with the IRA. The main unionist leader of the time, Jim Molyneux, just went completely white. The blood drained from his face. Not in anger. He just said in a sort of hopeless voice, well, that's it then. There's nothing we can do. There's no solution. Because what he meant was, if you go and talk to them, first of all, we can't continue talking to you. And secondly, and more importantly, he could not conceive of any kind of agreement that could ever be reached that would satisfy those who were involved in the IRA, just the same as people on the nationalist side didn't believe any agreement could be reached that would satisfy those on the loyalist side and which would be satisfactory across the community divide. I really began to wonder, what, what can we do? But I thought, John is really important in this. We can't get power sharing without him. We're going to have to take his idea and follow it to destruction. And that's what we did. It was very difficult. It was very difficult to even persuade myself to follow that line. It, it didn't seem to me it could possibly work. But there was no alternative, it seemed to me. And gradually, over a period of years, it became possible to talk with a range of people and eventually for the IRA to see the possibility of politics being a way forward for them rather than the use of force and violence. That was hugely important because it opened the door for some of the rest of us to talk with them. And a whole talks process began to develop. In other words, we moved from a place of thinking that we had to get the moderate people together to marginalize the extremists to a position of saying, actually, we can't have a peace process without talking to those who do the violence. <laughs> it seems very obvious now. You don't get a peace process by talking to the people who are already at peace, even if they disagree with each other. You talk to the people who are doing the violence and try to persuade them that there's another and a better way. There's another implication of it too, and that is that you've got to show them the better way. You've got to make it possible for them to leave the violence behind and get involved in democratic politics. And that was not an uncontentious business either. So we had a lot of conversations. And the thing that we learned most, I think, about all of this is it wasn't fundamentally about institutions and constitutions, about policing and the administration of justice, about human rights, about socioeconomic development. All of those things were very important, but none of them were of themselves the fundamental cause of the problem or indeed the solution to it. The fundamental problem was disturbed historic relationships among the communities of people on the island of Ireland. And the solution or the resolution was to address those disturbed historic relationships and build new and better relationships, which would then be contained and reflected in the new institutions where we would share power rather than have it divided, where we would have policing and an administration of justice to which everybody could give allegiance because its commitment was to protect everyone's human rights and ensure that everyone had a fair uh, a fair opportunity uh, and was protected uh, from any kind of criminal violence at all. It's a long and complex story, but the simple way of understanding it is that we had three key sets of relationships to address, those within Northern Ireland, between Unionists and Nationalists, Protestants and Catholics, those between North and South, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, the people who live there, people who live on the island, who famously, as John Hume said, could not agree how to share the island. And that was the nature of the problem we had to address. And the third important relationship was, of course, between Britain and Ireland. There were other important relationships with the United States, with the rest of the European Union, but these were the key relationships. And the peace process was set up with people representing each of those three sets of relationships in three strands. And the outcome, the Good Friday Agreement itself, therefore had three sets of interlocking institutions. Strand one, within Northern Ireland, a power-sharing administration where whatever party you came from, whatever part of the community you came from, if you were able to get a mandate, then you should be able to participate in government to the very highest level. Not with the Westminster model where those who win the election take everything, but where everybody in proportion to the size of the party and the votes that they get would be able to participate 
not just as members of the assembly, the Northern Ireland Assembly, but also in committees and as chairman and indeed get ministerial posts in proportion to the votes that they have. A quite radically new structure and form of government. We had to address issues of, of policing and administration of justice and, and so on and so on. But in strand one, we would have this institution. In strand two, the Northern Ireland Assembly, the new power sharing assembly would collaborate with the government in the Republic of Ireland. And there would be meetings there with North-South bodies that would address those issues upon which we could work together, North and South. And thirdly, there would be a British-Irish intergovernmental conference that would bring together the British government and the Irish government, not the parties in Northern Ireland, but the British and Irish governments to work together. One of the things about relationships, however, is that you don't sort them. You don't solve them. There's something organic that you have to continue to work at. And if the key problems were those of lack of respect, lack of fairness, and lack of success in democracy in relieving those problems, then we had to work at building respect, ensuring fairness, and developing the structures of a power-sharing democracy. And for the first while, there was a lot of work and a lot of enthusiasm to try to develop that. But as time went on, and as a new generation began to emerge, they began to some extent to take peace for granted. They forgot that you've got to continue working at the relationships. Some of the parties started doing and saying things that weren't very respectful of the other political parties. Not uncommon in politics, of course. In fact, tragically common all over the world. But it's not good for relationships. It makes people angry, frustrated, humiliated, and indeed makes them turn away from each other. And we see that globally. But our job was to try to bring people together to work with our differences. It wasn't about everybody agreeing. It was about how to disagree without killing each other. How to find ways of running our society together, even when we didn't have exactly the same ideas about how that should be done. And again, a new generation, of course, came along. 25 years is quite a long time. Many of those with whom I worked to uh, negotiate and, and, and reach the agreement uh, have resigned or retired from politics and, and some have died and, and moved on entirely from, from, uh, from, from this world. So a new generation came along, kind of took things for granted, thought it was all about returning to ordinary politics as is practiced in general. And the concentration on respect for each other and on fairness for everybody and on delivering on promises. Sometimes people talk about trust being essential to reach agreements. Trust is an outcome of agreements that are implemented as promised. It's not a prerequisite for reaching them. And so the trust began to break down as people began to not follow through on, on the kind of agreements they had made across the community division. Uh, respect began to break down and therefore the structures began to break down. And now the assembly has not been operating properly for some time, strand one not working. If strand one isn't working, then the cross-border bodies are in difficulties because there's nobody on the northern side at a ministerial level to engage with the government and the republic. And so we are left with the strand three British and Irish government component uh, that is still there, not working as energetically as it might and not working at all for a period of time, but now beginning to work together again. The period of the 25th anniversary did see some important developments. Because of Brexit, which has caused a lot of problem within Ireland and within the United Kingdom indeed, created a lot of difficulties externally with the, Brit with the British government and, and the rest of Europe and between the British government and the United States. The new Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, I have to say, though he comes from a very different political tradition than me, has been able to reset relationships with the European Union and reset relationships with the United States as well. Whether it will be possible to get all the parties in Northern Ireland back into the Assembly and working together is a bit more difficult to be sure of. We have a local government election coming up. That will, of course, be important. They're all very important to elected politicians. And we can hope that perhaps that will encourage those who are staying outside of the assembly, the Democratic Unionists, to come in. But my two colleagues, Eva and Peter, will have their own thoughts about that and will add to the conversation about what has happened over the years 
their thoughts about how good an agreement it was and how good the process has been since then. And indeed, they will have some very informed thoughts about how things may move forward for good or ill. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Eva, how about you? Would you like to pick up from there and tell us your thoughts and what you're seeing in your in your work and your travels? Uh, thank you, Jerry, and uh, thank you, John. It's always a challenge to follow uh, to follow John, but uh, as you can hear from my accent, I'm not Irish, and uh, I often reflect that my lived experience shaped very much how I perceive Northern Ireland and conflict there. Uh, for me, perhaps the most important geopolitical events happened around 1989, uh, when I witnessed transition from communists to democracy in Poland and in Central and Eastern Europe. But my you know, whole understanding of geopolitics was also very much shaped by the experience of the Second World War and the scale of devastation. So whenever I arrived in Northern Ireland and got engaged in um, peace process there, one thing which struck me is the scale uh, and the attention Northern Ireland has been getting, uh, which I think was both blessing and a curse. And my understanding of what tragedy is and uh, you know, what victimhood means, it's very, very different to what perhaps people in Northern Ireland would see. Whenever I um, uh, arrived in Northern Ireland uh, in 2001, uh, it was already post Good Friday Agreement. Initially, I had very little understanding of, of the peace process other than uh, general knowledge, a bit of history and uh, obviously general culture. But slowly, slowly, uh, I became a bit of an insider outsider. Being Polish helped me to some extent to engage with people from across political spectrum. Initially, my work took me into dealing with issues with new communities arriving as a result of the peace process, which caused a lot of tension in the communities. And often some of the local comedians were you know, joking that uh, for the first time, Northern Ireland is uniting against something else. And unfortunately, it was uh, hate crime and uh, racism and other forms of hate crime. So those conversations initially took me into the sphere of community development and peace building. But then slowly, I started moving into different areas and addressing problems which were on the ground. And while I cannot reflect that much about what happened uh, prior to 98, what happened since and through my work, something what we noticed that there was a massive gap in capacity and ability to deliver politics. There wasn't any institutional knowledge. Obviously, John, as a speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly, tried to introduce new rules and regulations and standing orders and the new forms of behavior. But people were still operating very much in a mode of you know, uh, negotiation and uh, perhaps finding it difficult to, to start implementing actual policies. And talking to a number of uh, representatives from political parties who were involved in a different kind of politics um, or struggle prior to the assembly, find it quite intimidating. And this gap remains. There is a massive gap in you know, capacity. Probably in the, about 10, 15 years ago, I got involved in work at the Northern Ireland Assembly. We developed a program called Politics Plus, trying to develop uh, knowledge and capacity of our elected members. But as we know, the assembly since uh, has been very shaky. You know, the institutions come together, uh, then uh, with any conflict, it comes apart, and so on. Which, uh, to some extent, is a you know a result of the of the framework and the sectarian division. Which, while people are not killing each other, the divisions are very much embedded in the community. But with the complexity of already very fragmented society. There is another layer. Northern Ireland is becoming a tale of two cities or almost like two communities on a different uh, speed lanes. You know, like there is, uh, on one hand, you can arrive in Belfast and Jerry, as you know, and you will see this amazing modern city with, you know, FinTech and cybersecurity and film industry booming and a uh, lot of young people and uh, amazing cafes and, and you know, uh, access to education. On the other hand, 
you've got the other part of the community who uh, feels traumatized, left behind, unable to catch up. So on, on the level of you know, sectarian division, there is a now new group emerging, people who are somewhere in the middle and those who to feel completely uh, left behind. There are a number of surveys which indicate that Northern Ireland is one of the best places to live in the UK and Ireland. On the other hand, when we scratch the surface, you know, the mental health issues, which Peter can talk uh, more about for the, his work at Inspire. Uh, domestic abuse, just yesterday I read a report, which is utterly shocking. Northern Ireland is one of the most dangerous uh, places in Europe for women. You know, alcohol abuse and so on. So the trauma within the communities is very much there. And uh, then for people like myself, trying to work in the sector is, you know, absorbing this trauma. I now work and live uh, in London, between London and Oxford, still very much engaged in the Irish peace process and trying to deal with some of the outstanding issues there. One thing which we developed and to which I'm dedicating a lot of uh, time is actually looking to this post Good Friday Agreement generation of leaders in mid Korea, bringing to the, together political, business, and civic leaders on a fellowship program, uh, trying to open up conversations. Those relationships with, as John said, been fractured and are not there, or people don't have those opportunities to, to meet and explore and innovate. We developed a program which very much focuses on you know, trying to rekindle the spirit of possibility among different communities. So, you know, for me, for, for the outsider, insider looking back, yes, you know, Northern Ireland peace process on one hand is a success story and perhaps for many people across the world, it gives a lot of hope. On the other hand, I believe that Northern Ireland is still in for a, you know, not an easy ride because of direction of travel, because of, you know, um, conversations around constitutional issues not quite resolved because you know deep uh, sectarian divisions uh, and also the trauma experienced throughout the community something what is there constantly underlining and uh, which can be very much felt in our work you know on daily basis Eva thank you so much for those very rich comments Peter what would you like to tell us Gary um, I've really enjoyed listening to uh, John and to Ava. And Ava made me think, you know, when she talked about the two cities and the famous novel, The Tale of Two Cities, the first line of it, I'm sure you can remember. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And this sense of paradox, um, I think, is one of the characteristics of this place. I, I grew up in Northern Ireland and I continue to live here. I've lived various places in the world, but the majority of my life has been spent here in Northern Ireland. And when I was growing up, I grew up within a middle-class unionist community, quite a privileged community. And there are two very clear memories that I have as a, as a young person. I'm quick to tell people that I wasn't, I wasn't affected by the troubles. You know, I didn't have a family member killed. I didn't witness a bombing. I didn't see any of the direct acts of violence. I'm 59. I was born in 1964. So my childhood and my adolescence were all at the height of the trouble. But I remember clearly I would come home from school as a schoolboy and uh, I would, I would do my homework and I would watch television and I would see that there had been bombs in Belfast or some of the things that had happened. And my father worked in Belfast. We lived in a town called Down Patrick, which is about 20 miles away. And he would travel up and down every day. And I remember very clearly this vivid memory of standing at the window of our house at around the time that he should be coming home, anxiously waiting for him to come home, having seen what had gone on on the news. And yet I'm quick to say that I wasn't affected. Second memory is about privilege. I learned to drive when I was 17 and I was uh, an enthusiastic driver. And I remember driving home late one night, speeding through a town. I was going over the speed limit and there were a lot of police checkpoints at the time. And the police stopped me and were quite angry with me for the speed that I was doing. They asked me for my driving license. I gave them my driving license. And the policeman said to me, Peter McBride, is your father Jim McBride? I said, yes, he is. And he said, well, um, Tell him Jim Hazlett was asking for him and just slow down. I'm giving my, my driving license back and off I drove. And for me, and so if I unpack that a bit for you, for me, 
the institutions of the country that I grew up in felt like my institutions. I was part of this. And that was simply a product of uh, the community into which I'd been born, the unionist community. And I had a sense of privilege, but I didn't think there was any other way. I didn't, I didn't really understand that there were people within the community that I, that I was part of that had very different experiences. And I only found that out as I became older and started to engage in, in, in more civic life. Um, when the Good Friday Agreement happened in 1998, I was relatively oblivious to the process. I, I am a happy recipient of the benefits of it. I remember clearly at the time going to vote. I remember voting yes enthusiastically. I remember seeing John Alderdice on TV, looking as, as young and as vibrant as he does now. And I remember a sense, a palpable sense of excitement. This meant this was something I didn't really understand it, but I knew it was something very important. Um, but I didn't really understand very much about it. Uh, and I understood that this meant that there was peace, that this was the end of something and the beginning of something new. If you unpack the vote a little bit, it becomes very interesting. The vote was 71% voted yes, 29% voted no. 57% of Protestants voted yes compared to 93% of Catholics. And 60% of unionists voted yes compared to 94% of nationalists. So arguably, it's fair to say that this was perceived more enthusiastically in the nationalist community than within the unionist community. Uh, and I think it is important because subsequent challenges to the Good Friday Agreement and the various amendments that were made to, in, the, in the St. Andrews Agreement were a product of unionist anxiety. Uh, because at the heart of the agreement was the principle, as John said in Strand, one of power sharing. And the disturbed historic relationships of which John spoke, one of the manifestations of that was the dominance of the unionist community in Northern Ireland and the subjugation of the Catholic nationalist community in very punitive ways. So this was not, an, uh, this was not a society of equals who were just in disagreement with one another. It was a society where one side were dominant and the other side were subservient. And I had grown up on that dominant side and had enjoyed the privileges of that. Uh, but that becomes problematic when, after the Good Friday Agreement, having attained peace, having stopped the violence, uh, we then needed to try to build peace. And uh, there is, in East Belfast, there's a mural, uh, which I quote often because I think it says something very profound about what it is like living in Northern Ireland. So it's a, in a loyalist area, so it's a Protestant unionist area of East Belfast. And the, and the mural says simply, prepared for peace, ready for war. And what the Good Friday Agreement gave us was the prepared for peace bit. It gave us a mechanism to make peace. But underneath it, for the last 25 years, there is still this, it's not a, it's not a real threat in the sense of, I, I would argue, and I, I, I suspect John would agree with me, that there's a, 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 a kind of a feasible actual return to violence. But there is a warlike spirit, if you like, underneath it. The divisions are still around. Uh, and when you, and, and one of the challenges that we have is that if you look at the three strands of the Good Friday Agreement, each of them um, served a purpose 25 years ago. But the purpose that they need to fulfill now has fundamentally changed. So in strand one, you have power sharing with different parties uh, taking on different departments, different government departments. It's, it's a forced coalition. Uh, so we have a very diverse parliament where it's not a majority rule. The, the main parties will have uh, uh, be able to appoint a minister to a particular as a minister for health from one party, a minister for education from a different party, minister for the economy from a different one. So, so at one level, that that's a, a nice sharing of power. If those people don't cooperate with each other, then there's no real sharing of power. There's no real connection between those very important government processes. And what you see happening now, uh, which is in a situation where actually Stormont has collapsed and and one of the reasons it's collapsed is the inability of our political parties to reach collective decisions or to, to work in a meaningful way together. Uh, when challenged to do so, they walk away. It breaks down. So the structure that was set up 
a form of it anyway that was set up initially by the Good Friday Agreement, arguably needs to now be transformed uh, because it, it is not necessarily going to uh, allow us to um, make the important decisions that we need to make. And we we live in a country, I have to say this, where my, my work now involves me a lot in the health service and many of the main institutions in Northern Ireland are in a process of collapse because of, apart from the economy, a lack of political leadership. And, and a lack of active leadership. And there's this kind of sense of dissonance where the primary reasons that our politicians talk about in terms of their, their motivations and their existence are to do with old disturbed historic relationships, old divisions. It, it, that's where they speak from. That's how they got their mandate. That's what keeps them in power. And yet the very people who have elected them are struggling with poverty, education, health. Uh, these are things that affect their daily lives. And there's a massive dissonance uh, between the needs of the people and the political systems and the political activities that, that go on in the minute, in my view. And then finally, and briefly, in terms of strand two and strand three, the north-south relationship has fundamentally changed in the last 25 years. Um, the south of Ireland uh, um, this year has a budget um, uh, profit. It's not in deficit. Um, it is a country that has become extremely liberal socially, and uh, not without its problems, but it has a, it has been it is a country that is transformed. It's also one where one cannot automatically assume that they would welcome a united Ireland, where the assumption was twenty five years ago that um, you know the, the the south of Ireland was a warm house and for uh, for this idea, and that actually a united Ireland would be something that would be almost universally welcome. That is now fundamentally different. And the strand three in terms of the British Irish relationship, there is a fundamental difference now between uh, the actually primarily between the relationship between unionism in Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK uh, in, in terms of Great Britain. And I would argue that there has been a fracture in the cultural connection. So for a unionist in Northern Ireland, there's very little sense of affection or connection with the current government, for example. And I don't think there's much confidence that the current government will look after their interests. So I think that the Good Friday Agreement, quite rightly, uh, is lauded as one of the most significant peace agreements in the world and was hard won. The challenge is, how do we take all the best bits of it now and, and remake it in a way that is relevant to the new challenges that we face today? And, and I think that is a really, it's a, it is a very, difficult challenge, but it's one that, that many people are exercised by. Peter, thank you very much. Very, very rich comments. I, I wonder now if uh, if the three of you, and I'll, I'll, I'll take part as well, if the, if the four of us could have a conversation for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, after which we'll invite uh, questions and comments from our listeners. Um, and you've said so much, there may be things you want to respond to each other about in this. Anybody have a have something immediately? Can, can I ask? I, I want to ask John uh, about the. I don't. I mean, I, I I was a periphery around those times. I was on the periphery of the whole process. But in in terms of just explaining what happened post ninety eight, in and, and the, the really quite important changes that were made that that had a material impact on how the Good Friday Agreement has been able to be implemented, John. I think this is really critical for people to understand. Yes, there were a, a number of elements. First of all, an important part of the agreement was what was called the Civic Forum. And this was uh, a body which did not have much power, but it, 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 it gave the opportunity of representation for various elements in civil society that were not political parties who were appointed to it. And the idea was that there are those people who have significant positions and views within the wider society beyond political parties and, and could have a non-partisan contribution to make, which I think is right and I think was a very good idea indeed. Unfortunately, they didn't really succeed in creating a space for themselves. Uh, they were too reactive and, and timid to really have an impact. And so after a period of time, they were dissolved. Um, and 
that was really a pity I, because I think that had the possibility of introducing a new element to things. Some of the politicians didn't like it because they said all that we had to go out and earn our votes and uh, and go out delivering leaflets in the rain and so on. These people got their positions because they went to cocktail parties with ministers and things of that kind, which was not fair. But it was a representation of how many of the political parties had felt marginalised by, by the political process. So that was one element. The second element was something that people didn't quite expect, particularly some of those who were involved, but is not entirely unusual. And that is the political parties that did the heavy lifting of getting us to an agreement on the unionist side, the Ulster Unionist Party, and the nationalist side, the SDLP, were the ones who did not benefit much from the agreement and the, and the new assembly. You might say, well, why was that? Well, I think there were a couple of reasons. First of all, one of the reasons is when, when you bring the two sides together, there is a deep anxiety about how that will work out. And each community chooses to put forward its toughest and most doughty champions. And so you don't defend yourself by putting forward the more reasonable people. You, you put in them the toughest people who will really fight the bit out for your community. And once they're in there, they, they, will, they hold on to the power. And in fact, what happened was that David Trimble's Ulster News Party and John Hume's SDLP went, went down. Um, and indeed, the Alliance Party found it pretty tough for, for a period of time as, as well. And there were the, the, the DUP in particular, the, 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 the more radical of the Protestant Unionist parties, um, insisted on some changes to the way that the executive was formed to enable them to say to their supporters, we were not working with Sinn Féin to get into government. This was a separate formula. When, of course, the whole point of the original formula was to require that the people who were at the head of government would work together. So it was important symbolically and practically, but it was particularly important because of the message that it sent out that we can we can do this without actually working together. When, of course, you couldn't do power sharing without working together. Now, one of the positive things that has happened is that as a new generation has come along, some of those young people feel that all this old history can be left behind. And so the Alliance Party has grown in strength very substantially, but the, the institutions that were created, which focused very much on the two big pillars, Protestant Unionist, Catholic Nationalist, don't leave much space for a non-partisan party in the structures and the voting arrangements and so on. And so when you quite rightly said that 25 years on, there is a need for a change, that what was done at the time may well have been perfectly reasonable. I think there is an increasing view. British government has said it, Irish government has said it, and most of the political parties in Northern Ireland have at least, they haven't all, all said it in a full-throated way, but, but they have certainly in most of the parties acknowledged that what we've got at the moment isn't working very well and does need to be changed, but it's quite difficult yeah. to change to change these things. I think the other thing that one has to say is that by persuading nationalists and especially Republicans that they could promote their vision of a united Ireland through democratic politics rather than the use of violence, um, they they've seized upon that. That's why we have peace, <laughs> but they've also been very successful in in doing it and pushing the business in the direction that we want, they want. Whereas for unionists, the idea of the settlement was, okay, we'll allow these guys to come into government as long as they stop killing people, but they hoped that it would then stay like that. And of course, no relationship ever stays quite the same. Even the Britain they felt they were loyal to is no longer the same Britain, as you quite rightly said. You also point out that Ireland is no longer the same Ireland as it was 25 years ago. So you touch upon a whole series of important changes that have not necessarily been reflected in some of the attitudes and stances of parties, and they certainly haven't been represented in the institutions that were created 25 years ago. John, if uh, Northern Ireland and uh, both your comments and Peter's comments, if Northern Ireland is in a form of interregnum and uh, if uh, uh, political parties, even civic society, find it very difficult to engage with each other in meaningful way, how can we create spaces where on one hand 
uh, there is a delivery of services, you know, as Peter said, you know, health service, education, everything is collapsing, you know, so would there, would there be a possibility of two parallel tracks, one focusing almost working like a factory, nuts and bolts and trying to, you know, bring the services up to speed, and then the place of healing, place of uh, resolving some of the outstanding issues in parallel, you know, like, I believe that, you know, those two sets of functions require different emotional approach, they require different skill set and different spaces. And I think it's not being addressed that, you know, we, you know, even if assembly is restored tomorrow, a lot of things will not be resolved, you know, because of the, you know, complexity uh, in, and, and fragmentation of the whole system. And also the, the, the utter mess which the country is uh, in at the moment. It's a very interesting question indeed, Eva. And, and I think the dilemma is something like this. For a long time, during the period of the Troubles, the, the services were maintained by British government ministers right. who came in, were not susceptible to local elections and all of those kinds of things, and basically made sure that, you know, that, that things still worked reasonably well. It's to be said that things aren't working terribly well in the rest of the United Kingdom or in other places as well. But, but, but nevertheless, there was that period of time. Uh, and, and then a, a generation grew up that realized they had to do the resolving of relationships bit that you've also referred to. What, what doesn't seem to have been possible is to carry both of those strands on into the present time. It, it should have been possible, but it hasn't happened. Is it possible to rewind to have some body of people that make things happen and make it all work and another body of elected representatives who, who, who recreate those better relationships? I don't know the answer to that. I, I Politically, it's very difficult. There's a huge resistance to the, from the British government to taking back some kind of power and control. And I think if they were to do it, the only way in which they could make it run would be by increasing the cooperation with the Irish government. Uh, that, in other words, would be saying strand one and strand two are, aren't able to function properly, but strand three can, can operate. That will be hugely problematic for unionists. It will be a bit problematic for, for, for nationalists. Although by the time that that happens, Sinn Féin may well be in government in the Republic of Ireland and they may not be so unhappy about running with something like that. But you then will have a real serious problem of unionist alienation. Now, that may just be what has to happen because there's a process of transition, as you quite rightly say. We're in this interregnum or process of transition in which things are the, the old ways, whereas Peter talked about unionists running the show, is over. Yeah. That's, that's finished. And they're finding it really, really difficult to cope with that fact that those days are gone and they aren't coming back again. And that's always a difficult thing. Um, and, it, and, and I think that's that's a very large part of what we're observing. And I'm not sure how much that how much emollient can be applied to that so that they they decide to live with it. Uh, that it's 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 very it's it's difficult. There's no quick, easy answer. But I think the points that you make. Are, are, are important principles to try to inject into the process. A yeah. very short comment. Uh, recently, I seen a post on social media with regards to the Civic Forum uh, that anybody who really desires to be on it shouldn't be allowed on it. <laughs> uh, you know, yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's, you know, while there have been attempts, there are continue to be attempts of reigniting something. You know, mm. it's uh, yeah. uh, it's how again how would it be selected and how could we you know make it work? Yeah. Well, we have an old saying in Northern Ireland: "There's not much to be said for reboiling your cabbage." You you use the phrase, John, and I've heard you use it many times: uh, "disturbed historic relationships." And um, I would I would be really interested in your assessment of the kind of status of disturbed historic relationships now. I mean, I think it, I think this has changed. I think it's changed quite substantially, actually, um, where arguably 25 years ago, the divisions were right down through society and 
and therefore the the the, the structure of strand one and the, the structure of, of government reflected that difference. My sense of it now is that they there are still disturbed historic relationships, but they are it's almost like there are small polarized groups. And I and I and I and, and the majority of society, the people that I you know mix with daily, I couldn't tell you whether they're Protestants, Catholics, or whatever. You know, it's it's it is less. I think it's less of an issue. However, I I'm not sure that our political establishment has kind of caught up with that shift. And I, I'd be interested in your view. Could I jump in there before you respond? Please, yes, because because Peter is uh, raising something I, I too wanted to raise. I've, I've in listening to you, to all three of you, I've been trying to locate the current disturbed relationships. And in a way, one of the questions Peter's raising is, is there a relationship between Catholics and Protestants as disturbed as it used to be, given what seems like the cooling off of religious fervor in the new generation, both in Northern Ireland and in the Republic? That's one question. The other the other disturbed relationship I thought I heard, which uh, which we see in the U.S. Uh, in quite stark form, is between a younger, more economically successful and educationally successful generation, uh, not particularly partisan, and those traumatized and, Eva, this is your phrase, left behind by the mainstream of society. That strikes me as a terribly disturbed relationship in this country, maybe in yours. And I, I wonder how you would think about that, so. Well, first of all, I, I think the, the problem with disturbed historic relationships is the disturbance that comes from history continues on into the present and into the future even when the reasons for the disturbance in the past are gone. And that's why I, I, I talk about them in that kind of way, so that even when you solve or resolve all the issues that in the past created the difficulty or exacerbated the difficulty, even when you resolve those, it doesn't mean that everybody gets on with each other because they still remember. The memory is still very powerful and very motivating to people. The second thing is that there is not a simple stasis. The external relationships are extremely important. And when unionists realize, and they do, and there are very powerful indicators of, of, of what is happening, when they realize that they are orphans now, that Britain no longer wants them, is no longer interested in them, is no longer interested in paying for them, that's a really difficult blow. It's a really upsetting thing. It's not so upsetting for, for nationalists and Republicans. They may complain about it because if there's not as much money for the budget, that's not good. And But that's normal politics. But there isn't the kind of sense of abandonment by your parent that there is in the unionist community. And, you know, finding ways of addressing that and helping them to realize that this is something that is happening is, is very important. So, for example, the recent decision by the Secretary of State uh, in, in London, Secretary of State responsible for Northern Ireland, to, to provide a budget which simply does not address the needs of Northern Ireland as they have been understood until now, could be seen and largely is seen as punitive. We're, we're, we're fed up with you disagreeing and we're going to cut your funding as a punishment. But actually what it needs to be seen as is Britain saying we're no longer interested in funding you? you we don't. We're, we're not. We don't feel attached to you emotionally in that kind of way. We, uh, and you know, we've got our own problems over here to deal with. We've got great long waiting lists for health and education and so on. We we need to attend to that rather than paying large amounts of money into the Northern Ireland budget uh, whenever uh, there's frankly not that much appreciation of it but also when we don't want to do it anymore we're we're, we're tired of that we're trying we're, we want we want you to go over there and get on with the people who live on that island so th this i think is important now the, the question of whether those who are economically left behind and disadvantaged and so on is a key part of this i'm not sure it's such a key part of this particular problem because there are people on all sides of the community who are left behind and, and they're unhappy about that, and legitimately so. But that's not, 
it's not as it was arguably uh, 30, 40 years ago when the perception at least was that most of the disadvantage was on the Catholic nationalist side. And mm -hmm. although there was poverty on the unionist side, you know, it, it, it wasn't felt in the same kind of way. I don't think that, I think that's now, I think that that's now different. And, and that's a problem that needs to be dealt with, but I'm not sure how much it contributes to the political stasis. Indeed, arguably, um, as, as Peter was pointing out, the political stasis continues in spite of the fact that resolving the political problem would address some of those left behind issues and still people vote uh, to keep things stuck. So I, I, I think it's yeah. a slightly yes. different situation. I think there is one more division if we look at the status of the future, that there is a part of community who feels extremely excited about the future, uh, you know, and the prospects of either yeah. United Ireland or all the opportunities it brings, and the part of community who feels shame and humiliation and a deep, deep, deep sense of loss. So, yeah. you know, we can, you know, divide uh, and, you know, Northern Ireland in different ways, but I think that something what is emerging and what is very present in our work is the excitement on one side and the loss on the other. I agree. Yeah, I, I thank you. I, I would like to open this to questions and comments from uh, from the audience. Uh, I know there, there are two already in the in the queue. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? There you are. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, it's about the phrase which... Uh, um, um, I have seen in many circumstances, also in other places, not only in, uh, I heard of uh, what happened in Ireland, but shows when, um, when the occasion arises, meaning uh, 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 two communities can live um, together uh, side by side, if you want, uh, uh, or uh, really together, uh, like in the marriage, as it happened in Yugoslavia, and suddenly, and to everybody's astonishment, uh, even in communities where there was a lot of intermarriage, the notion of ethnic uh, belonging becomes so strong almost overnight that neighbor kids neighbors uh, as a duty to one's own ethnicity. And that is a surprise probably also to the people in those villages, in the same way it happened in uh, Belgium, that uh, uh, when Belgium has been invaded by Nazi Germany, uh, the Flemish group uh, collaborated and presented with the Germans because they felt oppressed for a long time by uh, the uh, um, uh, by the Belgians. Um This was some sort of screen memory about what was by the Belgians. And it became, however, a motive to become very aggressive. Um, my question is, also in the case of Ireland, of Northern Ireland, obviously, what do you understand by when the occasion arises and everything changes and eventually becomes violent, like uh, uh, deep truth comes to the surface to the surprise of everybody? Was that clear enough for anyone to... Uh... You know, have a thought in response. I think it was a question really about how to understand the sudden eruptions, the sudden fragmentation of a community that has lived together and intermarried for ages. What, what, what does one make of that? I think it, it's a really challenging question. I mean, there, there are lots of examples of um, what are described here as mixed marriages um through, throughout the troubles and lots of stories of people having to leave um because they married from the other side that is no longer an issue um, I, I don't think it's an issue at all one of the challenges about northern ireland is that the fracture lines are not obvious um so when we talk about the disturbed historic relationships and we look at the different kind of components of that, these are not obviously discernible groups. They don't break down along reg religious lines, actually. They're, you know, religion is a useful sort of totem that, that allows for discussion about it, but it's, it's, a, it, it's not an adequate way of describing the sense of different. Neither, neither is ethnicity. Um, it's, it's a kind of strange combination of issues about identity. 
and identities have become fluid over the last while. So I can't conceive of a situation actually where this, whatever the external pressures are, the, the, the possibility of, of kind of a sudden outburst of violence from a whole community against a whole community is possible. Because, you know, arguably Northern Ireland, one way of looking at Northern Ireland is as a quadrant of four, where you have hardline Protestant and, and middle of the road Protestant or unionists. So unionists and loyalists are how they're described and, and the equivalent in nationalism and Republicans. And they're quite different, actually, those four, uh, in terms of how they relate to one another. So the middle classes would be uh, of both unionist and, and nationalist would would be the, the kind of sense of division is really minimal. And arguably the real sense of isolated communities reside in working class, Republican and loyalist communities. And the numbers of that are very low, you know, in terms of the rest of the population. It's a relatively small number of people. John. Well, there's, there's two things that I would say to, to just sort of build upon what uh, you were saying there, Peter. The first is that you have to understand what stage of community you're in. Mm. Uh, and we're at a community which had an outbreak of the kind you're describing in the early 1970s, where there was a very clear division and some people were driven out of some areas. In fact, one of the largest movements of population in Europe after the Second World War was, was at the beginning of the troubles in, in Northern Ireland. So that was at that stage. What Peter is, is quite rightly pointing out is we're not in that kind of place anymore. And so trying to analyze and judge us on the basis of that kind of analysis, it doesn't apply really anymore because we had that outbreak and we're now in a different kind of place. Not an entirely resolved place, but it's a different kind of place. The second thing is, when these things break out with an explosion that seems to happen very suddenly, in fact, the pressure has been building up for quite a long time. And then there's an explosion. I often say to people, dams do not burst gradually. They burst very suddenly. But the pressure that bursts them often does grow up gradually. And it was not that difficult to see the pressures that were building up in the 1960s in Northern Ireland. And some people did recognize it and try to make changes and they weren't successful in doing so. So I think that we, we need to sort of tease out a little bit more what we're really dealing with. What stage of the process are we talking about? What is the, the how far can you take the position at one stage in one community and map it onto a different stage in another community uh, with, with, with where there's differences in the kind of splits that you see in the community, which uh, uh, as Peter pointed out, you can't just take the situation in Yugoslavia or the situation in Belgium and transpose it directly onto the current situation in Northern Ireland as distinct from, you, you, you could make some crossover references between Yugoslavia when it was breaking down into violence and Northern Ireland when it was breaking down into violence. But that's a different kind of a thing from what we've got at the moment, particularly in Northern Ireland. David, you may have some thoughts about it. There isn't much I can add just to, you know, sort of uh, recent research by uh, Irish Institute in Liverpool College still indicates that, there, you know, there are mixed marriages and people actually more and more in the recent census would describe themselves as not belonging to any faith or background. So, you know, a lot of people are opting out for the other status. Uh, but with regards to marriages across, you know, uh, the, the, the original communities, it's still around 25, you know, 30 percent. So. Uh, you know, there isn't like uh, really big, you know, sort of, uh, but this is just sort of demographics and how things are, are changing and, you know, sort of new groups are emerging, including new communities. We have a question no. from Anne McMurray. Good evening. Uh, great discussion. Um, so here's my question. Um, the 1998 uh, Good Friday Agreement was a solution to the issues that we were in then, and it, it revolved around a lot of talking and communication. But are communication solutions the solutions that are going to move us forward now in 2023, uh, when we look at what's happening in the wider world and uh, in GB, UK, Ireland? So my question to each of you, I'd be really interested, what's intervention systemic, political, economic, do you think will move Northern Ireland from the current impasse 
where we don't have any political institution really working on behalf of the people here. Well, it's it's a it's quite challenging. It's something what I mentioned earlier. It's this tension between explore and exploit. That on one hand, at the moment we have nothing. You know, there isn't functioning government. Institutions are collapsing, and there are very limited spaces for discussion. You know, even uh, talking to some people after the big anniversary events around the 25th uh, anniversary, there was a sense of you know convening a lot of different events. There was almost oversaturation of you know of uh, people coming together but actually there wasn't any in-depth conversations it is extremely challenging and difficult to create spaces for meaningful deep conversations engaging with complexity something we're trying constantly to do both with fellowship uh, with the innovation lab which uh, both jerry and peter uh, participated in uh, it's uh, it is extremely challenging and difficult, and uh, I think that the new solutions are required. Uh, you know, a lot of people are trying different things, but we still don't have a critical mass of doing things in a systematic way. A lot of uh, community groups and geos, others are, and even both governments are engaging in ad hoc uh, convening of you know conversations and groups, but they sometimes are short term projects. This requires uh, medium to long term thinking and, uh, you know, what is happening actually in the nationalist community that there is more and more groups which are convening conversation about uh, the vision of New Island. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are a number of different initiatives which are gaining, you know, and gathering momentum, which obviously causes further fractioning in some communities and, you know, further fear, fear but uh, Definitely, I think the argument is of trying to stabilize the institutions as much as possible. If the assembly is back, and I know that there are cries of help of trying to make sure that you know services are delivered in a professional, effective, you know, um, comfortable manner. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, those spaces for for conversations are important. But you know, how can we actually get the you know community involved? Another thing I've been reflecting on actually today, uh, somebody posted the statistics of the, the participation in local elections. We know that in six days there will be election in Northern Ireland for the local government. It was between 51 and 53%. So we've got 50% of the population completely disengaged and you know, um, sort of getting on with their daily lives and trying not to, not to engage and not to think. Yes, I, I remember uh, in the political lab that we did, I think in 2019, Eva, there was a survey reported where um, many, many young people said they weren't at all interested in nationalism, they weren't at all interested in unionism, and they weren't at all interested in voting, which was really, really a, a huge problem. Um, and then I was also thinking Eva, about your your distinction earlier on. There are many people in our audience who are members of the International Society for the Psychoanalytic Study of Organizations, and and they will make a, the kind of distinction that you you made earlier, which is between, you know, good management. How do you get things done? How do you deliver the services? The how tos of doing something. That versus leadership, which is why we get things done and so that second strand that you're working on in the fellowship sounds so important to me Anne's question is a brilliant question um purpose of the good friday one of the purposes of the good friday agreement was to bring some degree of stability we are now in a situation where stability is not on the horizon there is a more meaningful possibility of a border pool the likelihood of a you know of a porter pool and the issues around the United Ireland. So the possibility of having a, a kind of a a sense of settlement is not reasonable, I think. And therefore I think there's a need for a, a it's almost like a new social political compact with um some sense of reality coming into our political system about um, these emerging constitutional possibilities. Historically, unionism has just kind of put their fingers in their ear and gone la, 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 when it comes to talking about a united Ireland. Um, if we are talking about united Ireland as a possibility, then there is a meaningful opportunity for unionism to create a place, a cultural 
um, opportunity for unionism to reinvent itself as part of a, of a new constitutional entity. That will either be, it either won't happen, or it will be forced upon them, or it will be something that they find a way of engaging with. But we need to find ways of talking about these major changes, which are reflected in global pressures as well, uh, where these kind of conversations become permissible. And, and I think we need a kind of political leadership that, uh, that is able to create language around this and able to create a sense of permissibility around these conversations for those who feel most threatened by them. Because unionists have gone from a position of dominance to feeling hugely existentially threatened. And that is that is not good for negotiation. It's not good for power sharing. It's not good for any kind of vision for the future. So it, I, I think there's something, there's certainly a need for uh, a, a change in the in the way uh, our government works and the way that it's set up. Um, but I think those big themes of, of understanding this is going to be a volatile time. And we need to be sort of grown up about how we engage with this and start to, and, and, and engage with these important issues. I'd say a couple of things about what could be done. I remember many years ago talking with Oliver Napier, who was the leader of the Alliance Party right away back in 1973-74, when there was a power sharing executive, which was participated in at the unionist side by Brian Faulkner, who had been quite a hardline unionist politician, but he had decided to sign up for power sharing. And it, it proved very difficult and so on. But the, the point was that Oliver said to Brian, and he told me about this, he said, Brian, why did you do it? You know, why did you go into power sharing? And all the difficulties and so on of it. And he said, well, it's quite simple, Oliver. The British Prime Minister told me this was the price of the union. In other words, if you want to be part of the United Kingdom, you're going to have to go along with what the government and overwhelming majority of the United Kingdom wants. Otherwise, you're not going to be part of the United Kingdom for very long. And we've had a recent vote in Westminster on the Westminster on the uh, Windsor Frameworks, where the vote was 515 to 24. And the 24 was all the unionists and a few assorted disgruntled conservatives. That's an absolutely, I've never seen a vote so colossal as that. And it seems to me that Rishi Sunak needs to be having a conversation with Jeffrey Donaldson and possibly even Jim Allister and saying, guys, wake up and smell the coffee. The whole of the rest of the United Kingdom thinks this is a good idea. And if you don't go with it, they're not going to keep bailing you out. And so don't see the cut in budget or the failure to increase the budget as punitive. You need to understand that actually, if you want to be part of the United Kingdom, you've got to play by the rules of the rest of the United Kingdom. You've got to respect. You're asking for respect. You're not, you're not being respectful of the rest of the United Kingdom. You're not paying any respect to England, Scotland and Wales and the contribution they've made to you over a very long period of time. The second side of the thing is that if nationalists want a united Ireland, as Peter quite rightly says, not all of them are at all sure that they do want one. But if they do, then they need to make an offer. They need to be starting to say to unions, well, look, here's the kind of thing we're thinking about. And actually, this did happen in a very interesting way in a, in a, a panel during the 25th anniversary celebrations where the four, part, four of the party leaders uh, were, were present and the DUP was represented not by their party leader but by another senior uh, person, uh, Emma uh, Pangeli Little. And uh, the question uh, that was was put by uh, uh, Mark Simpson, the, the 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 journalist, he was was pressing, what would Sinn Fein be prepared to do in a United Ireland? For example people who are nationalists within Northern Ireland now can have an Irish passport. In fact, anybody in Northern Ireland can have an Irish passport if they, if they were born in Northern Ireland. What, said Mark, would be the position of those of United Ireland? And interestingly, Mary Lou Macdonald, the leader of Sinn Féin said, unionists ought to continue to be able to get a British passport if they want. And Mark says, really? I think he's quite taken aback by the success of his question. He said, yes, absolutely. The British government needs to be persuaded that in the context of a united Ireland, they should continue to make British passports available to those who are unionists. She said, I'm not out to stop unionists being British. That's not, the, I'm not interested in doing that. They want to be British, that's perfectly fine. 
and they should be able to get British passports. That's not the issue, in fact. And I think that's very interesting. Yeah. And if that kind of thoughtful, creative, inventive uh, policy idea was, was part of an overall offer that Sinn Féin started to make and other nationalists started to make, actually the people that would have the greatest difficulty with that would be the British government, especially the Home Office. You don't want to give a passport to anybody. Uh, but but I, I think that there is the possibility of quite creative thinking. And I was quite excited, actually, by, by that yeah. proposition from Mary Lou, because it said to me, there is the possibility of some thoughtful offer being made uh, rather than just pressure being applied. Fantastic. Uh, now, it, we're, we're getting a bit late and we have three questions in the queue. And I think I'd like to take them all now and see what happens in the conversation. Lee? Okay, so um, the first one is Dr. Rhea Johnson. Oh, here we go. Uh, right. My question is, there she is, could you possibly, would you have the time to elaborate a little on the, the comment you made about the dangers to women in Northern Ireland? Okay, let's, thank you. Thank you for that. Let's hold that and take the, just hear the other two questions. Okay, so the next one is Richard Morgan Jones. Yeah, first, first of all, thanks ever so much, all of you. I've been getting a completely different picture this evening uh, from one I've had before. And I, I, I felt it was very powerful, uh, some of the new dilemmas. So thank you so much. But I, I think my question, two questions, um, is the picture you're painting that Northern Ireland is politically like a child unwanted by each of its parents? the UK and the Republic of Ireland, one might almost add the EU as well, uh, adrift with no vehicle clearly available for funneling the passion so fiercely felt in the past. Uh, could this be a new and very different trauma described better as a black hole that swallows collaboration? The last one is from Elko uh, Schwartz, and I'm going to allow him to talk, Elko. Um, thank you for the insights. And what struck me is the different fault lines that were not so visible to me before this conversation. Uh, what I'm wondering, and what's my question is, is how can we make sure that uh, younger generations continue to learn from the past? But that, that is for me the big issue, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Elko. The, the, so those you know, three three big questions put on the table. Anybody like to respond uh, first? Perhaps I will start and uh, then yeah. let uh, Peter and John uh, respond. So with regards to the first question and danger to women, it's just the latest statistics. Uh, there is uh, about 160 attacks, domestic abuse attacks reported to the PSNI daily. And we know that, the, uh, you know, not every attack is being reported. Uh, so, you know, there are a number of issues. Again, Peter will have more authority to talk about the uh, mental health issues, alcohol abuse, uh, dependency on drugs and uh, dealing with uh, trauma, which is quite often um, shown in, in that manner. So, you know, there is a serious issue which is not being addressed. On the other hand, still participation of women, especially for some political parties. Uh, again, there is statistics. I think there are three or four council areas in Northern Ireland when there isn't one woman uh, uh, candidate. Uh, so, so it's still the society which the equality uh, across gender lines, it's, you know, it's catching up. While we had the political leaders and uh, leaders of the parties, which are now uh, mostly female, uh, there are still things which Northern Ireland needs to catch up with. Uh, with regards to the second question, and uh, is Northern Ireland uh, like an unwanted child? I remember writing, uh, a uh, small piece for Belfast Telegraph uh, on the 18th anniversary of Good Friday Agreement and uh, saying that Northern Ireland is now, or the peace process is 18 years old and it's this, you know, still a slightly restless teenager, which is not quite wanted with a rich aunt in America and, you know, <laughs> some other relatives, you know, <laughs> bankrolling it, but uh, uh, still trying to find its sense of belonging and purpose and, uh, and we keep having those conversations with Lord Elder Days quite often. And uh, John has a quite a drastic view of it that it's not even unwanted child. You know, I referred in my article that it's like a child of divorced parents. John often says that it's almost like a victim of a rape, 
which uh, you know it's much more powerful and dramatic and uh, i let john to talk about it a little bit more uh, with uh, regards to the uh, third question and younger generation yes we we're trying to do what we can you know on one hand probably nobody wants to re-traumatize the next generation uh, and let people be and uh, you know there are again different different issues with regards to to, to uh, especially uh, younger people from the unis community who often leave to study outside of Northern Ireland and do not return. Uh, so, so there is a, a, a terrible uh, brain drain and, you know, and it probably uh, affects dynamics and what is happening within Northern Ireland. But, you know, there are lots of initiatives, uh, uh, quite a huge investment from, from the executive on different programs uh, of trying to engage young people. Unfortunately, uh, uh, another thing is the, the um, segregation when it comes to education. So 93% of young people would still be educated either in Catholic school or state Protestant schools, 7% attends um, integrated education. So quite often uh, people do not meet somebody from different backgrounds until they are at university or in the work workplaces. It's changing uh, slightly and slowly, but you know the segregation, this segregation in education is it's a major problem which uh, contributes probably to the overall situation and division in Northern Ireland. Thank you, um, Peter or John. Yeah, if if I may, um, I, uh, I'll let John have the last word on this. But I, I would answer each of these questions with um, by starting with a, a statement which which I believe very firmly, and that is that as a post-conflict society. Um, Northern Ireland carries with it uh, community trauma. Uh, it carries trauma in its DNA. It carries trauma as a, as a function of its identity. And that's not just that we have a number of people walking around with PTSD. Um, people experiencing PTSD as a consequence of the troubles are now in a very, very, very small minority. I'm talking about the lasting impact that violence has had on relationships and on the and particularly the sense of the internalization of a sense of threat. So I would argue that uh, part of the reason for violence against women and violence against women is is one of the horrific manifestations of this. Uh, but there are others in terms of an increase in racist attacks and um, the, the, the kind of tendency towards othering that is growing and growing and growing. Um, is, is, in my view, linked at least with the fact that as a society, we haven't come to terms with the disruptions of the, tra of the trauma that we've experienced, uh, what, what the repercussions of that are. In terms of the abandoned child, um, the image I have, you know, the Good Friday Agreement was achieved by people like John Alderdice and, and other significant politicians here in Northern Ireland, but it would not have happened if the British government, the Irish government and the American government hadn't got involved. And if you want to think of them as benign parents, um, what one of the things they provided was containment. They provided containment that allowed the chaos here uh, to, to be in some way controlled so that we could find a way of making peace. And that sense of a benign, benevolent, containing presence is now gone. Uh, and therefore, what you're seeing is this sense of existential angst and crisis, again, which when you layer in the experience of trauma in the past is a very volatile and makes it makes people feel very insecure. There's a real palpable sense of anxiety about our future. And then the third question, Elko's question about young people, young people are growing up into this. Um, young people are not clean sheets. Uh, they're absorbing this, whether consciously and un or unconsciously. And, and any of them who say, I'm not interested, I don't care, it hasn't affected me, I don't believe they understand what they're talking about. If Unless they get out of Northern Ireland or unless they're able to get some sense of different perspective, um, they will find themselves affected in ways that are um, really quite, uh, because they're normalized and they become, this. you know, as you live here, um, this stuff is normalized in a way that's terrifying. It, only by stepping away and looking back at it do we begin to see just how actually toxic sometimes and, and difficult this can be. Brilliant place it is, as it is, but actually there's some deeply toxic stuff going on that is completely normalized for us. And young people are growing up with that. And I think unless we start naming some of this stuff and dealing with it, uh, it will be left unattended. John? Yes, just a, a, a couple of final comments. Add to what Eva and, and, and Peter have said rather than something completely different. I, mean, I completely agree with their comments and analysis. Um, 
it, it's not at all unusual that in conflict societies and post-conflict societies that you get domestic violence. That's not at all unusual. And it's a serious problem and it hasn't gone away and it needs addressed. And the second thing that brings me to is Northern Ireland is not immune from all the other horrible things that are happening in the wider world. The world we live in today is a world of deep polarization, danger, threat, and terrible trouble to the point where we could actually bring the existence of our race to an end if we don't address issues like climate change and the threat of, of nuclear catastrophe. Northern Ireland is part of that world. It's not completely separate. And therefore, some of these wider anxieties also impact on Northern Ireland, sometimes in slightly different ways because of our history and background, but they do impact. Northern Ireland is not so much a place apart as perhaps it was at one time, and, and that's something we need to be aware of too. It does have its own experiences, and, and Ava's quite right, uh, uh, my, my use from time to time of, of, of the analogy of Northern Ireland as a child of a rape, historically. Like any analogy, it's only an analogy. It's not a reality. It's a way of thinking about things. Um, the other analogy that, that Richard is using is that of a black hole. These are all analogies. They can be helpful, but don't take them too far. Uh, otherwise, the analogy breaks down. But the final question is maybe the most important one of all. Is there a way that we can make sure that the past is not forgotten by younger generations? And, and there are lots of ways we can do this. One that I would mention of the moment is that when I heard George Mitchell's quite extraordinary speech at the 25th anniversary, I spoke to people at Queen's University who had put it on and recorded it, and it's on their YouTube channel. And I said, that's absolutely great. Can you make a recording of that directly available and send it to every single school in Ireland, north and south? Because it will help the gener new generation to understand from the mouth of someone that knew it intimately and contributed to bringing peace in an emotional way that was really powerful for young people to get a sense of that. It's that kind of thing and that specific thing, quite honestly, that I think is important for us to try to do to respond to Elko's question. Thank you. Yes, and I, I found myself thinking in response to something you said, Peter, that on the one hand, there's the fear of traumatizing the next generation with the stories. Sometimes there's a fear in the next generation of traumatizing the older generation by really wanting to learn the stories. And yet sometimes really learning the personal stories of what happened to your parents and grandparents is actually one of the ways forward. So I, 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 on behalf of the IDI and all of our listeners, I want to thank you so much, the three of you, gave us so much to think about and your hearts are so deeply in it and your your brains are as well so it's wonderful to hear you and hear this conversation thank you very much for joining us and thank you to our uh, audience for for being part of this and for sending us your questions and and we hope to see you at an event like this sometime in the future thanks everybody thank you, thank you so much, much.